Okay, good morning everybody. Let's begin. You know, it's really fortunate that it's raining today. It's going to make your homework assignment a little bit easier. Um, if you've looked at the homework assignment, you'll notice that the last problem asks you to calculate the time of concentration for the parking lot that's just right outside here. And to do that, you have to get an idea of what's the area that's contributing to the flow towards a grate. And in dry conditions, you can kind of get a sense for that by walking around the parking lot and trying to, you know, put your eye down to the parking lot and see where's the elevation break points. Uh, but on a rainy day like this, it's really easy. You just go into the parking lot and you look. Where is the water coming from? Where is it going to? And what are the boundaries of the parking lot area that's contributing to the junction in question? So does everybody understand what I'm talking about? Have you looked over that assignment? Uh, Jeffrey, have, do you have a question? So we have to roughly sketch out what area of the parking lot is being the water is down into, correct? That's part, of the, that's part of the homework. That's not all of it. Well, I meant like a, on the individual part. I mean. Can you rephrase your question? So here's a parking lot, right? Here's, here's a, a grate that water goes to. So not all of this parking lot drains to that grate. So the question is, how much of that parking lot contributes flow to the grate when it's raining? It, you know, draw the boundary that delineates that watershed. And the, uh, the opportunity you have is that today is a rainy day. Okay, so in the homework I ask you to use a couple of different methods to calculate the time of concentration and we're going to uh, go over those methods today but there's a lot of detailed explanation about the variables and what needs to be substituted into the table that I reference. All right, so that assignment is due on Monday. It includes the rational method and we're going to continue talking about the rational method today uh, in class. Um, this is where we left off last time. Um, we have a simple network that's accepting um, stormwater in a couple of junctions. So 1.1 is where water flows over the surface and it's a grate connected to a catch basin that feeds water into pipe A. And then 1.2 is also a grate. Pipe B connects to pipe A. And then here in pipe C, there's going to be flow from three different locations. Pipe C is going to have some of the flow that got in at the grate and junction 2.1. Some of the flow through pipe C is received from pipe A and some of it is received from pipe B. So does everybody understand the, uh, the general layout of this pipe network? Okay. Um, so the spreadsheet template that uh, I gave you a printed copy of last time and is also available on uh, Blackboard it takes us through the process of determining how big the pipes need to be. And in the end, what we're going to be doing is substituting flow rates into Manning's equation to solve for diameter. Uh, the process here is, first of all, we want to find the area multiplied by the C value. Who can refresh our memory on what is C value? Coefficient of runoff. Coefficient of runoff. Good. And uh, like roughly speaking, how would you explain what it is? It's rate. It's a ratio. It's a percentage of what? Okay. So it differentiates between the water that's absorbed and that which is running off. And so which which will see like if, if you have something like a pavement, is the C value going to be very low for pavement because there's not much? that's infiltrating into the soil? Or is the C value going to be very high for pavement because there's a lot of runoff? Like it, it could express that same thing at two extremes. You get what I'm saying? So is the C value high for impervious area or low? 
It's high. Good guess. You got it right. You gambled and you won. Maybe you knew. But yeah, a, a high C value uh, is associated with impervious surfaces because what C does, if you look at the, the equation, the rational method, C I A. So from a parking lot, you're going to have lots of peak runoff. So Q will be large for an impervious surface like a parking lot. And so to get a big C value, you have to have a high, excuse me, to get a big Q, a big runoff, then the C value would need to be high. Um, and so it's, it's the percentage of water that runs off. It's the, the percentage of water that runs off of the total that's falling onto the surface. Okay, so the process that we're going to go through in this spreadsheet illustration is we're going to first look at the areas and then for the area in question and what we know about its characteristics like the slope and the length that the water has to travel, travel we'll come up with a time of concentration and use this intensity duration frequency curve to find the rainfall intensity. So that'll be our second step. And then finally, we'll use Manning's equation to solve for the required pipe diameter for that flow rate that's been estimated. Okay, so in this case, um, if we go to the handout that I gave you, and let me see if I can pull up that template file on my own computer. All right, student start file. This is the one, I think. All right, so here's our network sketch. And we're first going to look at what's going into pipe A. All right, so the information that we have is the length of pipe A, 390 feet. Everybody still have this, this handout to refer to? Okay, we know the slope of the pipe. And so upstream junction, just for us to keep track of what's at either end, the water flows from 1.1 towards junction 2.1 in, um, in that pipe. The contributing area of 2.2, let's say that somebody has already gone into this area and walked the boundaries. They looked at the elevation break lines and they did that delineation for us. In the diagram here, what it's referring to is, see this dashed line? That's meant to be a division of the areas that are contributing to the flow at 1.1. So here's our area, the area of flow that is all draining towards a central location, 2.2 uh, acres, and then the C value is related to what's in that region. It maybe has a blend of impervious surfaces, some grass, maybe some buildings, and so we do a weighted analysis and find out the C value for that area. So the C times A is just what you'd expect. It's the C times the A. And so what that is, is um, it's kind of weighting together the area and the percent of that area that's impervious. And so 2.2 acres at 0.65 means that essentially that's the same as 1.43 acres of completely impervious area. Now the sum of the CA doesn't come into play quite yet, um, not for this pipe anyway. It becomes important for pipe C because pipe C is carrying flow from uh, multiple areas. And so for now, the sum of the CA just means that pipe A is only carrying flow that got in at that one inlet. So it's just the same thing as adjacent to it. Time to inlet and the upstream time, that's referring to the estimation of how long it takes for water to flow over the surface from the furthest most point away from the uh, inlet to, towards the inlet. So we need to do an analysis of, let's think about a raindrop that falls here at this edge. What path would it take? What is the travel time to get towards the inlet? What about this corner? Does it have a more circuitous route that takes a longer time? We look at all the possibilities in the longest travel time for all of the regions that contribute flow to that junction. Let's say it's been estimated to be 11 minutes. And that's an overland flow, <coughs> meaning that it's water that's just at the surface. 
There's no other areas that are upstream yet because this is the first pipe in the network. So that's why that's already saying zero. And so the time of concentration that dominates here is going to just be the time to inlet. In pipe C, you'll notice that we're going to have to consider three all options and then pick the largest of those. But so far, it's just the same thing as the, uh, as the previous upstream T to D. And the same thing will be true here. A lot of these columns are put in just in case we have a really complex network. We would need to distinguish between uh, the time of concentration and then a, a governing T sub D. But in the simple, like upstream part of the network, they're the same thing. All right, now the intensity. Where does that come from? Let me show you how to read an intensity duration frequency curve. If we go back here to zoom in on this, let's scroll up a bit. Okay. This diagram is showing for a certain storm duration, what would be the intensity? All right, so the first contributing area that we're looking at is the area that feeds into pipe A, and it had 11 minutes was our travel time. So what you do is you go here on the horizontal axis and you find 11 minutes. You go up, intersect the curve for the design storm, and then over to the left. And so it looks like we have a rainfall intensity of 4 inches per hour for a storm that has a duration of 11 minutes. Now why do you suppose that if the storm duration was shorter, let's say just for example, if the storm duration is 5 minutes, you'll notice that the intensity is much larger. The intensity is about you know, 5.3 inches per hour. Why is it that a longer duration storm has a lower intensity? I touched on this last time. Do you recall what would, like, what's the general relationship? Like, it's like you have a higher intensity for a shorter duration. That's right. Yeah, yeah. higher intensities are, are associated with lower duration. And from a physical perspective, what causes that is just a really saturated cloud becomes less saturated as, so as soon as the storm begins. And so a high rainfall intensity may be that you have a cloud cover for a much greater elevation thickness and so like the the depth of cloud cover is taller or that the density of precipitation inside that cloud is higher at the beginning but once it starts raining it's kind of um, the pressure is removed a little bit and so the intensity decreases and we'll go into a lot more of the specifics on that but that's the general trend and so back to our spreadsheet here um, four inches per hour we got by reflecting the T sub D off of that curve. All right, so now the, the flow rate. It is going to be Q equals C I A. So here's the C and the A. Multiply it by our intensity. And so that's 5.72 cubic feet per second. So uh, the, that's the worst case scenario for our design storm. You know, I don't know if this design storm is uh, like the 10-year storm or the 25-year storm, but we were given this curve as saying this is the design storm. And so the, uh, the peak flow is going to be 5.72 cubic feet per second. And now what we need to do is calculate the required diameter with this equation. So let me show you how we would type that in. So this is just Manning's equation rearranged to solve for diameter in a circular pipe. And it's assuming that the water is flowing full. So this is exactly the diameter that would be required if the water was all the way up to the top. Now for traditional units like we have, uh, you'll notice that this M factor in Manning's equation where we've combined a couple of uh, terms together, M is 2.16. And so I'm going to be sure and type that in. Okay, so first of all, I need to put in the parentheses 2.16, and now the flow rate in cubic feet per second. So that flow rate is found in cell Q3. Okay, times the N value for the pipe. That's the roughness coefficient, and I have it here at the top of the spreadsheet that 
For this particular pipe, the roughness is 0.014. I'm going to anchor the reference there in case I decide to repeat the formula somewhere else. Divided by the square root of the pipe slope. So SQRT of this pipe slope. All right, and I close the parentheses, and then it is to the power of 3 eighths. Now what that tells me is that if the water was all the way to the top of the pipe, if it was completely full, then the pipe diameter would need to be 1.08 feet. They don't make pipe in that diameter. And so what I have to do is take the next commercially available pipe size. I need to round up to whatever is available. And so let's say that the, uh, the pipe size that is available is one and a quarter feet. They don't have 1.08, but they do have one and a quarter. So I round up to that, and then the flow velocity, let me delete these existing values here. Um, we need to calculate the velocity with um, the cross-sectional area. Uh, the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So V is Q divided by A. And so the velocity is going to be the Q that we've calculated divided by the area. And it means the area of uh, this larger pipe. So pi times D squared divided by 4. Okay, so it's going to be 4.66 feet per second. And then the, finally the flow time, that's saying how long will it take for the water to get from 1.1 to the downstream junction 2.1. So the pipe itself is 390 feet. So what's the flow time for the water that gets into the inlet and then has to travel downstream? So that is the distance divided by the velocity, and that's going to tell me how many seconds. So that's 83.67 seconds, but I want that in minutes, and so now I divide by 60. Okay, so the flow time through the pipe, 1.39 minutes. And we can repeat that process for the other pipes in the network. So pipe B, we look at the, uh, the upstream junction is 1.2, the downstream junction 2.1. The area has already been estimated for us. The contributing area is 1.2. And so if you look at the boundaries here, it's this dashed line. All of the water inside this shape is contributing to flow into the grate at 1.2. Looks like we have a higher C value at that location, so it just maybe has more urbanization, you know, relatively more pavement, roof drains, and so on. So then do that same calculation of C times A. And then there's no upstream pipes that are contributing, so the sum of the CA will be the same as CA there. Now before I go any further, are there any questions or uh, anybody not sure on what we're doing? I will mention that <laughs> These definitions, I think, are pretty important, so I, I won't read them to you now, but after class, I'd suggest that you kind of revisit the structure of this spreadsheet and refamiliarize yourself with what each of these columns is meant to represent. So I've always told you that when you do a spreadsheet, you need to row by row explain what's in every column. That's what I've tried to do here, is I've tried to explain you know, the definition and how each of the columns is calculated. All right, so um, we got the sum of the CA, you know, all of the upstream area that's contributing to flow through pipe B. The time to inlet is just the travel time over the surface. That's been estimated for us already. Later today, we're going to talk about what equations maybe could be used to do that. And that's because of overland flow. There's no upstream parts of the uh, network, so the upstream flow time is zero. And the governing time of concentration is just this uh, 9.2 minutes. That's what governs for that part of the pipe network. And it's going to be the T sub D is the same as the T sub C since it's just a single pipe. 
All right, intensity. Let's just double check and make sure that we understand how to do that intensity. So it is 9.2 minutes. If we go to the figure, this is the duration and rainfall intensity for a certain design storm. We're looking at 9.2 minutes. And so here's 9, maybe a little bit to the right towards 10. So we go up and then to the left. So it's not quite 9.5. It looks like it's 9.3 or so. Let's see. What I had previously estimated was that for that time, yeah, did I see? Yeah, 4.3 inches per hour. Okay, so then Q equals CIA. So we've got the C and the A here. And multiply it by the intensity. So the water that's going to be going through pipe B, the, in, the, the flow rate that has to be accommodated, is 4.13. The diameter required, I think I'm just going to be able to copy and paste that formula down. Yeah, so the, the reference up to the end value is anchored and the other ones I don't want to be anchored. So I can just control C and control V and it tells me that the pipe needs to be 1.28 feet. Now let me ask you, why does the pipe need to be bigger if the flow rate was less? Look at this last one. The last one was 5.7 CFS, but it only needed a 1.08 foot pipe. Have we got an error? Why is this saying that for the lower flow rate, a larger pipe diameter is required? It's not an error. There is an explanation. Look at the equation for required diameter. Why is it that it's maybe saying this pipe diameter has to be larger? even though the flow rate's less. It's the, it's the slope. What about the slope? Good. So pipe B isn't set out at a very steep slope. It, in fact, it's very shallow, 0 0.004. So that's 0.4% slope. So since it's laid out so flat, uh, we're going to have to have a larger pipe diameter to accommodate the necessary flow. And then we do the same thing where we ask the uh, pipe supplier or our inventory people, what's the next, uh, next largest commercially available pipe? And so maybe that would be a 1.5 foot diameter pipe, since we, we 1.25 wouldn't be large enough. And then the same thing where we're going to have the velocity by the flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So let me just drag that formula down. And it'll tell me what is the velocity through that pipe. It's less as we, as we would expect because it, remember, is that shallow slope. And then the travel time, I can apply that formula downward as well. 1.31 is the travel time in minutes. All right, now pipe C. This is the complicated one. What makes pipe C complicated is that water is coming from three places to get into the pipe. Some of the water gets into the pipe at junction 2.1. So the water that's getting in directly at this grate has previously just been flowing over the surface. So there's some surface water getting in there. And then pipe C is also accepting flow from pipe B and accepting flow from pipe A. So there's three different sources of water, and we have to look at each of them individually. So first, the preliminaries. Let's just kind of uh, clarify which pipe we're talking about. We're talking about the pipe that has junction 2.1 as the upstream junction and 3.1 as the downstream junction. We've done the delineation of the contributing area. We looked at the break points and the ridge lines and where's the curbs and gutters and we estimated that it's 3.9 acres of area that contributes to the flow at that junction. And we likewise did a weighted average of the C values. So the runoff coefficient is 0.7. So the C times the A tells us how much of the uh, how much of the impervious area 
effectively is contributing to flow at 2.1. But now the sum of the CA. This is asking for all of the area that's contributing to pipe C. So from the three places together, what's the sum of the C times the A? So it's going to be all of these. So the cumulative contributing area is 5.12 acres of impervious area, effectively. Yes? For pipe B, mm -hmm. is A not included since it's downstream? So, or C? I don't know. I don't know. So the flow is only coming from one spot, I guess. Yeah, in pipe, the, the flow through pipe B is only getting in here. So the flow through pipe A doesn't contribute to what's in pipe B because they're coming together at a point. Good question. Yeah, so A and B, it's just only the surface flow, but then pipe C is getting it from three places. Question? Since uh, 3.1 is downstream at 2.1, uh -huh. would that pipe I guess, put it in C? Would pipe C, uh, you would see that flow then? Pipe C is not going to see the flow that gets in at 3.1, but it does see the flow that gets it at 2.1. And so this example actually uh, continues a much further. Like it's a pretty complex network. And so there is a pipe D, for example. And then pipe D is going to have flow from 1.1, 2.1, 1 1.2, and 3.1. So I think you definitely get it. Okay. Um, now, we need to keep track of, we need to find out what's the governing uh, travel time. Because remember, not only is there three different quantities of flow getting into pipe C, but we need to find out the water that's getting into pipe C, what's the longest travel time before it gets into pipe C. That's how we know which rainfall intensity to use, is by looking at the travel time between when the raindrop fell on the ground and when it gets into the pipe. So there is the 13.7 minutes of travel time that's been estimated for us. That's like the surface flow. So that's the overland flow travel time. And then how much was the travel time from 1.1? Well, it was the 11 minutes is the surface travel time. And from 1.2, was 9.2 minutes, but then it's not just the surface travel time, it's also the pipe travel time. Okay, so now you're going to start to see how T sub C is different from uh, the T sub D. The, uh, the time of concentration for the water that's just going over the surface and into the junction is just simply that 13.7, but the flow that's coming from junction 1.1 has the 11 minutes and the 1.4. So it is the sum of those two times is how long it takes before the raindrop that falls in area A gets into <laughs> pipe C. So I'll also find out what was the total time for this the raindrop that falls in this region that's contributing to 1.2, how long does it take accounting for both the overland flow and the pipe flow? So it's 10.5 minutes when I combine the surface travel time and the pipe travel time together. Now the largest of these three, the longest of the three, is what governs for the T sub D. And so I have to look and say for those three different travel paths, which one is the longest? And it is the 13.7. Now it's not always going to be that the surface travel time is the largest. It could be that maybe one of these other ones would have been the governing, but in this case it is just the overland flow going in directly at 2.1 that is the longest of the three. And so with 13.7 minutes we go here to the curve, 13.7 minutes up and over and that is where I estimated it would be, boy, that's pretty, I'm being pretty optimistic about my uh, ability to discern on the curve. I said that's 3.68 inches per hour. Boy, is that realistic? 
Okay, here's 13.7. I don't know, maybe 3.6, 3.7. I'm calling it 3.68, so we'll go with that. So then Q is going to be, remember, CIA. So here's our I, and I need to multiply it by the sum of the CAs. So the big one, accounting for all of the area, all of the area that's draining into pipe C. So there's going to be now 18.84 CFS in that pipe during the peak condition. Maybe 10 minutes after the peak, when the intensity is lower, it's not going to have to carry that much. But like right at that penultimate moment, when the rainfall intensity is at its worst and all of the areas are contributing simultaneously, then we have to accommodate 18.84 or else the, uh, the network will be undersized. And so to do that, let me drag this formula down again. Remember, this is Manning's equation solving for pipe diameter in traditional units. It says that I need a 1.62 foot diameter. This slope is the steepest of all of them. So even though it's a pretty big flow rate, the pipe doesn't have to be that much larger necessarily. It is still going to be, remember the rule is, we can't make it a smaller pipe downstream, otherwise there could be like a clog or the accumulation of debris. You can't go from big pipe to small pipe, but if it's a relatively steep slope like it is, then it seems like we'll be able to get away with maybe a 1.75 foot diameter pipe. And when we do that, then the flow velocity 7.83 feet per second. That's getting pretty high. That's a pretty high flow velocity. So we need to uh, check with the pipe manufacturer and make sure that the scour velocity tolerance is lower than that. And I think in concrete pipes, 10 feet per second is oftentimes an upper limit. So we may be okay. We may not need to switch to like a, a plastic pipe or uh, you know, a specialty coating or anything like that. We may still be fine there. And then the flow time, it's only going to take 0.38 minutes since it's moving at such a high velocity for the water to travel from 2.1 down towards 3.1. Okay, so that's how you would design a pipe network with Excel. That's part of the uh, homework assignment. You've already done a more complicated network than I ask you to do in the homework assignment. In the homework assignment, all you have to do is two pipes. And so there's one that's receiving surface runoff. It flows through pipe one. And then here in pipe two, there's water that's getting into catch basin B and water that's coming from pipe one. So go through the process of determining the required pipe diameter, not just like the exact pipe diameter, but do a little bit of research online and see what are typical commercially available pipe sizes. What, what pipe, pipe sizes could you see actually for sale? Or is there a site that tells you typical pipe sizes? Jeffrey, do you have a question? So we're not worried about costs in this case. This one we're talking about worried about costs. Only to the extent of, I don't want you to say a 10-foot pipe will work. Because of course a 10-foot pipe would work. So I want to find the smallest pipe size that will accommodate the flow. Yeah. Other questions? So here's your intensity duration frequency curve for the homework. And you'll notice that there's different curves for different return periods. So if you're designing for a 10-year storm, then the curve you're going to be reflecting the duration off of will be the 10-year curve. So how do they calculate the travel time? There are several different ways to calculate the travel time. And that travel time is based on uh, the idea that water is flowing overland, over the surface uh, in a shallow depth. It's called Hortonian overland flow that we're trying to estimate with these empirical equations I'm going to show you. And there have been a lot of different efforts over the years to come up with equations for certain uh, like narrow niche um, situations. Like for instance, the FAA 
has areas that they're interested in, long runways, wide tarmacs that are relatively flat. You can't have a hilly uh, taxiing area for airplanes. And so the problem that they've recognized is when it rains and you have all this flat concrete and asphalt, that um, you have to have a pretty good understanding of how deep the water is going to be and how long it takes to move over the surface. So the FAA has their own equation of overland flow times. And there have been other situations where they've looked at different types of topography and tried to estimate how long does it take for a raindrop to fall onto the surface, fill the voids, wet whatever vegetation or other surfaces there, and finally begin to move over the surface. So we talked on Wednesday about the idea of you know, wetting the pores of concrete before the water starts to flow over the surface of concrete. What takes even longer than that is if you have a grassy field. Think about the, uh, the specific surface area, meaning the, uh, the surface area as you look down from above of grass, there's um, more than just the plan view area. There's each individual blade of grass which is sticking up the surface of that has to be wetted before there's going to be a pooling of water that begins lateral movement of the, of the flow sideways. Now, here you can see that there's a bit of a channelization. Can you see how it's accumulated? Once water begins to accumulate and travel in a stream, then we can't really rely on these overland flow methods anymore. These overland flow methods are generally best for flow as a sheet over the surface. But if it's shallow, concentrated flow, there are other approaches we need to take. Now, kinematic wave is often thought of as the most accurate of the uh, time of concentration methods because there's the most going into it. I mean, the more complicated the equation, the more accurate it's got to be, right? That's the thinking anyway. But I mean, there is some truth to that because what this is accounting for is it's counting for how rough is the surface. So the end value, the Manning's roughness. The idea there being that if you have a really rough, jagged surface, that's going to slow down the velocity of the flow and increase the travel time. So that's why it's in the numerator, is that a big end value associated with a rough surface contributes to a larger travel time. L is the length of the flow path. So again, if you're traveling a longer distance, then that's going to increase the time of concentration. In the denominator are two factors where a big number would decrease the travel time. So the slope, for instance, it's pretty obvious that the steeper the slope, the faster the travel speed is going to be and the less the travel time would be. And so that's why we see slope being accounted for because clearly it's going to be something that affects how quickly the, move, the water is moving over the surface. But the, uh, the intensity of the rainfall is a little bit more subtle of an effect. I think we maybe also touched on this Wednesday. Does anybody have a sense for why rainfall intensity would change how long the travel time is? Why would a high intensity storm mean that you have less travel time as the water is going over the surface. Think about this parking lot. On a day where it's just drizzling, how long is it going to take for that raindrop to get over the surface? If it's just drizzling versus if it's a heavy downpour. Okay, so part of it is it's taking less time to wet the surface. You're right about that. Are there other effects as well? Hmm. So you're, you're wondering if maybe it has to do with the drop velocity itself. Well, maybe the drop is falling through the sky more quickly if it's larger, but then once it hits the ground is when we click the stopwatch. So the travel time that we're talking about is when that droplet hits the ground, and now it's having to change direction because it was falling from above downward and now it's traveling sideways. So why is it traveling sideways faster when the rainfall intensity is high? Exactly right. Good. So he's remembering the, the no-slip condition and the idea that you have a velocity profile or the deeper the water is, the water that's at the top of that depth is able to move more quickly because there's less frictional resistance. It's further away from the point where the shear stress is resisting the flow of the water. 
So the ground is stationary, the water's flowing. The deeper the water is, the more quickly it can flow sideways. A shallow depth, the velocity is less because there's more, on a relative basis, more um, re resistance and not pipe friction, but we can think of it as surface friction. All right, so that's kinematic wave. It's really accurate. The tricky thing, though, is we don't know the rainfall intensity until we know the time of concentration. Remember our, uh, our diagram here? So one of the parameters in the kinematic wave is rainfall intensity. And so you have to know the rainfall intensity in order to know the duration. But you don't know the rainfall intensity until you know the duration. So that's why here in the slide it says that this is a trial and error approach. Because you have to just guess a rainfall intensity, see, put it into the equation, what is the time of concentration, then correct your rainfall intensity. So you guess and close in on a converged solution. It also only applies for distances of about 100 meters. Because water traveling a further distance than that begins to be, become channelized. And this is describing surface flow not channelized flow. Do you understand what I mean by channel flow? Um, I don't have a marker, but it's just flow, flow is a sheet. Um, here are some n values that you can use for surface flow in that equation. Now NRCS stands for National Resource Conservation Service. And the resource that these guys are trying to conserve is soil. Um, soil erosion is a really big problem. Um, because you may be, have you heard before it takes 100 years to generate an inch of topsoil? You know, that the, as organic material decays, it's a really slow process to get topsoil. But when it rains, um, or when the ground gets disturbed due to construction or development, we disturb the topsoil and it's prone to scouring and getting into the river. So on a really rainy day, if you look at the Ohio River, it looks kind of chocolatey brown. And you maybe have noticed that in the, own, you know, the creeks by your house. That on a rain, uh, like when it's heavy, intense storms, the water color changes to a more brownish appearance. And that's because of the suspended um, clay and soil particles in it. So these guys, uh, National Resource Conservation Service, their business is soil conservation. And they want to understand a lot about hydrology so that they can preserve soil. And they have their own formula for coming up with the time of concentration. And it does not include rainfall intensity, but it does include a surrogate for rainfall intensity, something that's not iterative. They'll have you put in the two-year, 24-hour storm as a precipitation depth. So it still does have length and roughness and slope, but instead of this iterative approach that the kinematic wave equation uses, they thought, well, it'll be simpler if we just have a fixed precipitation depth rather than the, uh, the trial and error process. So that's another way of estimating time of concentration. The Kirpich equation is another formula where we're getting progressively simpler now. We no longer rely on an n value for roughness, but instead they have these correction factors. They're still in some way acknowledging that different surfaces will have different travel times, but they do it in a much more coarse kind of uh, rule of thumb approach where they're saying, well, this is the standard equation, and if you have grassy channels that are going to be slowing things down because of the resistance of the vegetation, then double it. Or if we're talking about flow through a concrete channel, multiply it by 0.2. So it's best for natural basins, for, uh, for bare earth. So we're talking about like soil that doesn't have a, an active crop on it, but it has been adapted for these other material types. So you're going to have to do this for the homework. You're going to calculate what is the concentration time for all of these different methods. And when you do that, you're going to have oval and flow on asphalt. So you'll take this equation, solve it, and then multiply it by 0.4 to find what time does it predict. 
There's another equation called the Izzard equation that's mainly for pavement and turf. They have these retardance factors that try to account for differences in surfaces. They didn't want to rely on an n value, just a different way of uh, empirically correcting the Kirby equation. All right. Um, we have just a little bit of time. We're not going to do this uh, time of concentration example, but I do want to see how many of you have been able to install StormCAD so far by a raise of hand. Everybody's got StormCAD going. Okay. Did they give you like a way to update it? Uh, I just I checked my connection client and it's already up to date, but I can't check more because my user account's been locked. All right. So it sounds like you and I need to get together maybe during my office hours and we can troubleshoot that. Well, so. Um, Did you find that video you were looking for Wednesday? What video was that? It's escaping my mind. Oh, oh the the exploding uh, oh. the pressurized yeah. pipe. Hmm. I think I know where it is. <laughs> you want to see a pipe? Yeah, we have just the right amount of time for that. Oh, I knew there was a video and then it slipped my mind. I was like, I didn't remember. Yeah. Like we just take a quick glance at that. The, uh, the homework assignment is first related to determining what pipe diameter is required. And so we went through the Excel method. You don't have to do it on Excel, by the way. You can do all of these calculations by hand. What we're es essentially doing is we've got the area, the C value, the time of concentration is given, so you're going to use that time of concentration to find the intensity, so Q equals CIA. Find out for the Q that's getting in to catch basin A, how big does the pipe need to be? And so you're solving this equation to find the required pipe diameter, and then you're rounding up to the commercial pipe size, and then when sizing pipe 2, you're going to have flow getting in to catch basin A and flow getting in to catch basin B. So, you know, just kind of revisiting the logic of the spreadsheet to find out which of the two uh, flow paths governs, like what's the, the travel time that is going to be the one that you have to pay attention to. So that's the first part of the assignment. The second one is I want you to try out these different Kirpich, Izzard, FAA, and kinematic wave equations. Just try it out for the uh, parking lot that's behind the building. And I've already done the legwork of looking up the intensity duration frequency curve for you. So this is the actual rainfall data for Huntington. And it says that uh, a, a two-year storm, what the 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on the, the intensities are. So we want to find out how much water should this great be prepared to accept for a storm, two, five, and ten year storms. Okay, so that's due on Monday, and then also on Monday we are definitely going to get into um, StormCat. So that's it for today. I will see you then.